um, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the situation that I always hear um, of the issues down the hall in my office. I'm with the agronomist, Josh Bashong. He gets the calls about the fall armyworms. Um, of yep. course, um, producers with wheat pasture like to plant early, early, early. And that's right. That can be a problem. So when you get it up there, Dr. Royer, go ahead and take it okay, away. Okay, where's the share screen? That's, there we okay. go. Okay. Yep, it should be right at the bottom. Um, there we go. It'll take just a minute. Is it working? Yes, I see it looks great. All right, good. Um, well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, spend some time today. I'm gonna talk about a fall army worm and, uh, and since it's almost winter, fall army worms over, but I, I do wanna share with you, you know, I guess I have a little bit of history with, uh, you know, I've spent 23 years here, so I, I can give you a little history about what I've seen with fall armyworms since uh, I first came here. Um, let's see if I can get this. There we go. Um, just to review everybody, fall armyworm will attack weed in the fall. Um, that's why it's named the fall armyworm. We see it typically in late summer and fall, and then um, it does not, and it will attack wheat, sorghum, and corn. So it, uh, sorghum, and to a lesser extent, corn can serve as a bridge crop for it to come into wheat in the fall. Uh, so it attacks sorghum and corn in the summer and fall, and then it'll move over into wheat. Um, so this uh, pest can infest wheat from planting through, we have the time we get a killing frost. Populations will build through the summer and they in, typically infest uh, wheat in late summer and fall. So what I've noticed is that anybody that wants to plant for uh, forage plus grain or just use for forage, their uh, wheat's gonna be a little more vulnerable to um, con consistent continued attack uh, infestation from fall armyworm. Larva stages uh, last from 21 to 28 days. So, uh, you know, a lot of times we'll have, you know, uh, 45 to 50 days of growing time before we maybe get a killing frost. So we can have a couple of generations, but not only that, we can continue, we can have continual flights occur um, uh, and continue, continual egg lay occur because we have multiple generations that have been developing in uh, corn and sorghum, uh, particularly sorghum and, and, and other grass areas in the summer. Um, I have a, I had a, um, a worker that has, we've been running fall armyworm traps uh, from, you know, early, late summer through, uh, I think we just pulled them out last week and, and we'll continually get flights of fall armyworm coming in um, throughout that whole time. They might see a little bit of a, a wave or not, but, uh, a, you know, fluctuation in flights over that time, but we, we, we will continue to see flights occur. So uh, the wheat's never really out of, uh, never really out of risk from being attacked by fall armyworm until we get that killing frost. Um, got a picture of uh, what to look for in early uh, stage feeding when the larvae are too small to actually chew through the plant, they will uh, cause this kind of window pane activity activity. Uh, if people don't get out in the field, if, if a person doesn't get out in the field and actually look at the plants, they might mistake it for cold damage or frost damage a little bit, but uh, in this case it's the caterpillars that are feeding. Um, their optimum temperature for growth is 82 degrees. Eggs will hatch in three to ten days after being laid, depending on temperature. They go through six instars. That means that uh, the, when they, the caterpillar hatches out of the egg, it's a first instar. When it, it sheds its skin for the first time, it becomes a second instar and so forth. So uh, it will shed its skin five times before um, it um, becomes a pupa. They pupate in the soil and the moths will emerge anywhere from nine to 14 days later. But do you wanna point out they don't overwinter in Oklahoma? Um, unlike some of the other army caterpillars that we have that can attack wheat. 
Um, I want to just kind of share with you something that happened in 2016. This was a year where we really had really bad numbers. And uh, there was an entomologist that liked to do theoretical kind of um, uh, mathematical, um, liked to play with math a little bit. And so he, he kind of calculated um, uh, if you had 5 million moths that uh, would have been around uh, in late um, May, um, and they uh, started attacking uh, 10,000 acres of sorghum, say, the next generation would be 25 million moths that would be ready to fly. The next generation would be 125. So they're, they're basically increasing by about five times so that by the time they get to Oklahoma, they didn't, they, we, we could see anything from 125 million to 625 million moths flying around. So that's when they can get into wheat. And uh, that's why we see the issues that we see. Um, so that's what happened in 2016. We just had a huge buildup uh, from sorghum and <clears throat> they also get blown up and move migrate northward from their uh, overwintering areas in, in Texas and, and they're kind of a semi-tropical insect. So that's why we get them flying up and, and continually causing bigger and bigger numbers um, later in the year. This is something that I do like to point out because I've, I had this call several times in, in pasture and in wheat where the, the quote was, boy, it seemed like my crop was just doing fine and then it almost like it disappeared overnight. So I wanna illustrate what's going on here. If you go out in the field, you might not even see the smallest caterpillars that are out there when you're out checking unless you look really closely. And by the time they're noticeable, they're probably in their fourth to fifth instar. But I do wanna point out that all of the, if you see this chart, all of the, um, plant material that they will ever consume in their life, 77% is in that last three to four days of their life. They will, that's when they consume the most uh, of their uh, plant material. So they literally can destroy a field in a few days because of how much they're eating in that last instar that they only, that they only live for three to four days. So they really can do just exactly what someone says if they're not ready for them, not checking earlier. Up until they reach fifth instar, they've only consumed about 20 to 25 percent, you know, of their of their plant material that they'll ever consume in their whole life as a caterpillar. So that last thing, 93.5 percent of all the food that a fall armyworm caterpillar will consume in its life will occur in the last five to six days of its life. So, and uh, as I said, for scouting, we like to look at separate locations, look for the feeding damage on, and then start examining for caterpillars on the ground. I do want to point out something here though. That pencil is pointing at one caterpillar, but there's actually three caterpillars in that, that picture. Uh, there's one in the top left corner. It's a very small one. And there's another one that's even tinier that's down in the top, uh, kind of more towards the bottom corner of the plant. So you have, you know, I've gotten old enough now that I have to have glasses on when I'm even scouting fields anymore. I'm gonna miss those little ones because they kind of blend in with the same color of the wheat and uh, uh, they're tiny. And our threshold's two to four per foot of row with feeding damage evident. We have numerous insecticides that are available to control them. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things that are available that we can use um, to control them. It's just a question of making sure you do control them. And the bad news is if you're planting wheat early and wanting to have it available for uh, forage, you may have to spray it twice to, to preserve the, the, the amount of forage that you want to have just because we continually get flights and some of these products at the time at the the temperatures that we're spraying them at don't necessarily have a long life um, you know in terms of the field life um, you know and we continue if we continue to have you know 
at the most, you can probably get a couple weeks worth of uh, residual activity from most of these pyrethroids, but we can continue to have flights uh, up to a month and a half after um, the, the, the wheat's up. So chemical control issues that result in significant fall army da damage. Early planning results in multiple flights, continual leg lay well into fall. Uh, sometimes it's just the, the low price of wheat um, will keep someone from really not wanting to spend any money on that field. Dry conditions after the wheat's emerge can, can be a problem because the wheat won't spring up quite as quickly and, and the, the caterpillars can uh, keep up with it a little better. And there's also really, if you think about it at that time, a small amount of plant tissue that's actually covered by the insecticide. There's a lot more bare ground and it, you know, um, it, it just it just can reduce the the activity and if it's if it's in the ground it can get mixed up and tied up in the in the soil where it's not as effective in cultural control that we like to think about just remember killing frost ends their battle late plantings can reduce the threat of damage but that kind of goes against what anybody that wants to graze is is wanting to happen so uh, some people just take an option if they have a field that doesn't have a lot of forage, they'll just go ahead and replant to, to maybe recoup it, um, their, their uh, returns in, in grain. So here, that same picture that I showed you a little while earlier, I, I actually pointed to the two other caterpillars that are, were in that picture. And you can see one of them is so tiny, you can barely see it. And, but, but that counts as uh, a threshold, two to three per linear foot in the interior of the fields and plants are small. That's just a good illustration to look closely. A lot of times what I do when, when the plants are that small is I'll just, I'll just kind of um, wave my hand over the tops of the plant, and knock them off the plant. But a lot of times they like to hide underneath the underside of the plant and they'll, they'll fall to the ground. Then you can see them. They'll, maybe start crawling and you can see some movement and that kind of thing that helps uh, you see them a little easier. And, you know, I just thought I'd say something while we have time. That's not the only army type caterpillar that we have that you need to be thinking about. Um, anybody that planted late this year needs to be think, it needs to at least watch their fields for army cutworm. Um, especially if they want to have any, um, if they want to have any uh, grain in the springtime um, in dual purpose systems. If they planted late, uh, that is a, those are perfect conditions, kind of bare soil or very little plant material or perfect conditions for the army cutworm to fly in and lay eggs in the field. Um, unlike fall army worm, these things um, are can easily spend, you know, a spending a winter in Oklahoma is nothing to them. They because they spend winters in South Dakota, North Dakota, and into Canada provinces. Um, they can spend the whole winter through there and and, and finish up. So uh, Oklahoma winters, well, I you know they can be bad at times. They're nothing to these these critters. These uh, fortunately, these things are very susceptible to pyrethroid insecticides, and this might be. Uh, the timing might be correct, uh, possible for you to include a pyrethroid insecticide with a, a, a winter top dress application of nitrogen because they're very susceptible and, and uh, that, that pyrethroid insecticide will get rid of them. But they, like I said, they can feed and tolerate cold temperatures. Typically, we see them more out in the panhandle than we do here in, in uh, the rest of the state, but they can cause problems here occasionally. They're an occasional problem that we see. Um, get that same thing. Uh, uh, I had a producer out in in uh, Texas County tell me, he said, my wheat was coming up, looked great, and then it, it's like it turned around, went right back into the ground, and we started looking around out there, um, turning over some dried cow patties as well as uh, stirring up the soil, and we found plenty of army cutworms out there that had uh, taken out a lot of his, his wheat. And of course, if we have really good growing conditions this spring and, and kind of wetter weather, 
where, where we get less lush uh, foliage develop in the springtime. We have another army worm that uh, can cause problems. It's what I refer to as the true army worm. And they do overwinter. And we typically see them right about the times the heads are popping up um, out of the boot stage. And they like to feed on the beards and, and do all of that. So um, they'll, and they'll cause lodge. They, they really like areas where plants have been lodged uh, from wind or so forth. They'll lay eggs in there and you'll see kind of infestations of them there. And they will clip heads, but we typically don't see them cause a problem with clip, head clipping um, where it causes a lot of yield loss. They like to go for the secondary ones that aren't going to produce much uh, wheat anyway. And scout on a cloudy day or at night is better. Uh, they, they will start crawling up the plants at night, so it's easier sometimes to see them with the flashlight than it is during the day. But we have a treatment threshold of four to six worms per foot a row. And then the last army worm that we have is one we call the wheat head army worm. It's one that you're probably not going to see until about harvest. Uh, they blend in so well, but they like to feed. They literally do feed on the, the um, seed, and they cause... Um, they can cause damage to the seed, especially at harvest, and you'll see the worms crawling around with the seed. And uh, it can be mistaken for um, insect damage kernels uh, where you get docked for it. So uh, unfortunately, we don't really have a good threshold or um, there's not really a good reliable way to determine whether you have a treatment threshold. Some people treat around the edge of the field because that's where they tend to occur more heavily than uh, in the interior of a field, and you can maybe reduce them down by that. I think based upon our time, I'll stop there just talking about the army worms that you might encounter in your wheat fields. Um, I am uh, I am just want to point out that I am working on a project right now about adding pyrethroid insecticides to winter top dress nitrogen applications for winter wheat. And my original thought was, is this really a good idea? And uh, my data I, I do believe in science-based information, and my data tells me that uh, it's uh, that here in Oklahoma it does pay for itself uh, easily. So I'll just uh, save the rest of this talk for another time, and um, um, and and end here in case anybody has questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Royer. There is a question related to this final slide a little bit. So uh, the question is, can, can you apply the insecticide with the fertilizer, or with the nitrogen via the center pivot? Um, well, I, I, believe, I believe there are some, some of them, um, the insecticides that are registered to be applied through a center pivot. So anything that, that has that in its, uh, label would be fine and I'm sure if you got it out in the field it would kill them. The question I got earlier today at the um, wheat growers meeting was using can you will this uh, system work with uh, nitrogen streamers um, instead of you know broadcast application and I had to admit that I, I don't know whether it will work. We're trying to figure out what this application is actually killing and, and uh, get providing benefit to the wheat, but uh, that one spoke, you know, triggered my interest and I have to maybe have to uh, retrofit one of my buggy sprayers with some streamer um, applicators so that I can see if it's doing the same kind of thing as it would with the broadcast application. But like I said, anything that's labeled that you can apply through chemigation, um, should work fine if you want to apply it that way. Always follow the label, right? That's yes. Um, Dr. Rayner, I did have, go ahead, Paul. I, ha I have a question. When you're scouting for these fall army worms, how, how much field coverage do you really need to have and what's the most effective way to, to get the right amount of coverage in a field when you're scouting? Well, I usually, I usually, I encourage people a lot to just not scout at the edge of a field, but maybe take a transect through there and look at the, you know, uh, 20 spots. It, follow a W pattern or a U pattern or something like that, where you're maybe at five or six locations, but you get out into the field because depending, you know, with, with fall armyworms, sometimes you get them moving in from road ditches 
um, to the edge of a field and you might not actually have anything out in the middle of the field. And, and in that, a situation like that, you may want to think about just doing a, uh, a border spray, you know, or spraying the, you know, the roadside ditches plus, you know, a few rows within the wheat field if they're migrating in as caterpillars. Um, but otherwise you need to get out and really look in the middle of the field because the moths, they'll lay eggs in bunches and that, you know, you never know where they're gonna stop and um, dump their egg loads. So it's important to know what you've got going on in the whole field. So Dr. Royer, I have a question because sure. I know so little about this. Um, so is there any other, you know, you talked about spraying or the chemicals, is there anything from a management standpoint that producers could do prior to planting that would minimize these insects like following a different crop or, you know, making sure there's nothing in the field so many weeks before planting? Um, it, it's a little tough with the fall armyworm because they just they just come in and, and they're okay. start they're starting to lay eggs as soon as your plants are coming up out of the ground. And, um, you know, um, because they're flying and they can fly, they're really strong flyers. Um, you know, a crop rotation or anything like that is not gonna not gonna really impede them from coming in. I don't think. But that you know, the only thing that you might want to you know, I, I have done this to um, work with some of the county educators and give them pheromone traps so they can at least uh, have some kind of a, a weekly record of what kind of flights are coming in. And if they, they saw that they're getting a really big flight one week or so, they could at least uh, give a pre, you know, pre warning that, yeah, within the next week or two, you ought to be out looking in your field pretty heavily just to make sure. Um, we do know that if, if you use a pheromone trap, to collect the moths and you see a big moth flight that doesn't necessarily translate to those moths laying in that field right next to it. They, uh, but it does give you an indication that there's a lot of moth activity in the area and uh, producers need to be looking around. Okay, well, thank you. So is there any, if there's not any other questions,